A day can seem to have no beginning and no ending. It becomes a 25-hour day that blends into the one that came before and the one that is to follow. It is not necessary to be a military man to understand how long a day can be. A shot fired at Bien Ho, Da Nang, Quang Tri, Haiphong, or near Hanoi can strike home in any city, town, or hamlet of 50 sovereign states. 8,000 miles away can still be very close to home. And because it could come closer still, we share the conflict and the strength. We also share the understanding and the courage to prove that the honor of a nation's word has greater meaning than formal letters written on a scrap of paper. If he is a reasonable man, a man with a purpose. The range of his understanding of his purpose reaches far beyond his line of sight. He knows the big picture. He understands that attempts to intimidate by force must be resisted by force before intimidation becomes a way of international life. And this he also knows. He and the thousands like him, fighting and sweating on the ground, by the spearheads of our Department of Defense total effort, an effort concentrated to help the men on the ground to achieve their purpose and their mission. Above field and jungle, close air support. Help clear the way for the man on the ground. Reinforcing. Return to care and safety, those who have taken as well as given. Support those men during the long hours of daylight and the longer hours of darkness. Support them with B-52s against concentrations of troops and supplies. Give the enemy no chance to rest. Support them with tactical fighter bombers to keep up the pressure and help destroy our enemy's ability and desire to attack. Support them with hundreds of thousands of tons by airlift. The supplies come through, but there are other lines of supplies that flow the other way along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It winds down from the north through mountain passes and under the cover of green top jungles. For North Vietnam, it is the lifeline for their aggression. Along the flank of Southern Asia, the coastline of North and South Vietnam takes the form of an elongated S, a demilitarized zone between the two countries along the 17th parallel at the sea was established by solemn treaty. To the north is China. To the west are Laos. Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, India, and Pakistan. 
Moving down from the north, men, oil, machines, the tools of war are fed along the Ho Chi Minh Trail to bolster the aggression in the south. They move by night over the narrow roads, through mountain passes, and along trails hidden by the jungle foliage. Trucks and pack-laden coolies by the tens of thousands. Usually, by day, they remain hidden in the jungle to venture out again at nightfall to carry their lethal burdens along their narrow lifeline of aggression. That lifeline must be severed. When it is repaired, as it always is, it must be severed again. The infiltration uh, increases in both men and equipment has required a very sharp increase in petroleum imports. Since the first of this year, the average monthly imports of petroleum into North Vietnam have increased 50 to 70 percent above the comparable period in 1965. Stocks on hand prior to the attack were estimated to represent about two to four months' supply. The increased importance of petroleum to the enemy's military efforts is further attested by his action to improve the routes of infiltration. Some of these routes are new, some have been widened, some have been upgraded for all weather use. Bypasses have been built, and bamboo canopies or trellises have been built over the jungle roads in many places in order to inhibit observation of them from the air. A result of the greatly increased movement of men and supplies by truck and by motor power junks has been a shift from a small arm guerrilla type operation against South Vietnam to a quasi-conventional military operation which involves major supplies, major weapons, and heavier equipment. Every gallon of fuel, every gun, bullet, even every ration of rice destroyed north of the 17th parallel may mean the life of a man on the ground south of the 17th. The military call it interdiction. That is the mission of those who fly to the north. Support the men on the ground by strangling the supply routes. They fly from the decks of our Navy's carriers. They fly from the surface of the land, the supersonic weapons of our Air Force's tactical fighters. They turn their noses north, north toward Mugia Pass, toward the fuel storage areas near Hanoi, north to interdict the trains carrying in supplies. The pilots do the flying. The ground crews keep them flying. It's an around-the-clock operation. Fly the mission, maintain the aircraft, repair the battle damage so that the next mission can be flown. No one counts the hours in a day. They keep close track of the months and weeks that they have left to sweat out to complete their 12-month tour of duty. But they don't count the hours in a day. All activity is monitored in aircraft vehicle control. Each operation is on a fixed time schedule. Often planes have to fly on paper before they can fly on missions. Nobody's job is easy, but then Nobody ever said it would be. Every so often, fellows will ask, why me? Why should I be here? One way or another, they have to find the answer for themselves. Usually, they do find the answer. Then, they have another question. What more can we do? The answer to that one is simple. Work your guts out for the men who fly the planes. A pilot's tour of duty is a hundred missions. One hundred missions to be flown A hundred targets still unknown But it's my belief that my thunder chief strikes a telling blow to help G.I. Joe Till a hundred missions I myself have flown. Hmm. 
For the pilots, a day can start at 2.30 a.m. or earlier, or any time. Somebody's son, somebody's father, maybe everybody's hope. Never before has air war demanded such degrees of judgment and responsible self-discipline. In mission briefing at tactical operations, information pinpoints refueling tanker locations and gives us our ordnance configurations. We'll get call signs and radio frequencies to use for the F-4Cs, and our own F-105s will be flying cover against possible MIG attack. Wing intelligence will have photos of our target area and what to expect in way of defenses. The anti-aircraft and small arms fire are heavy. Worse for us than the surface-to-air missiles, the SAMs, and they're bad enough. But destroying our targets will help cut the flow of supplies toward the south. Furthermore, the daily tonnage of supplies moved overland from North Vietnam into South Vietnam has increased about 150% in the past year. And the infiltration of armed personnel has increased about 120% during the same period. Before we suit up for a strike, each flight leader briefs his own flight. There are four in a flight, plus one extra, a spare in case one of the four can't take off due to an aircraft mechanical problem. Our flight leader details our entry into the target area and then our tactics for getting the heck out of there. We listen because we respect him, because he'll be leading the way in. Five men in a small briefing room, many groups of five in many small rooms. For maybe the minute and a half they'll be over the target area, They'll spend hours of flight planning and briefing. Pilots have always been fighting men. But to courage and daring, today you have to add the great technical skill and self-discipline demanded by their sophisticated weapons. But weapons no more effective than the men who fly them or those who keep them flying. Case in point. Combat aircraft are maintained with a dedication that results in flying hours at a rate three times normal usage. The line crews understand how much depends on them day after 25 hour day. the spare is a very decent fellow, but now he's been through the hours of pre-flight details. He can't help but hope that one of the other aircraft will show up with a minor hydraulic leak or a cut tire. Sometimes that happens, but not today. Supersonic blasts of power in the open ocean of the air, ready to play their part in the overall coordinated effort. There are other flights in the sky. The F-4Cs are en route. At the same moment in time, the big choppers, affectionately known as the Jolly Greens, are on their way with A-1Es for their protective escort. Their object is to stay as close as possible to the target area, so that if a pilot in one of the attack planes has to hit the parachute, then they can move in to pick him up. If there's enemy ground fire, those A-1Es dive in to keep the enemy's heads down. in the KC-135 tankers have been waiting to refuel the tactical fighter bombers en route to their targets. Those KC-135s will keep orbiting in case any of the boys run short of fuel on the way home. The overall coordination is the result of a total plan by the Department of Defense team effort, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. 
most people will ask pilots the same question over and over. Aren't you scared? The answer is always pretty much the same. Sure we're scared, until we button down the hatch. We're a one-man sort of operation. We're our own navigator, radio man, radar operator, and bombardier. Getting into the target, we have to take evasive action. Then it's pop up, dive in, drop the bombs, and get the heck out of there. You watch your fuel. You go over in your mind what the intelligence boys will want to know about the results. At the target, the ground defenses, all the details. You might be scared when you start, but after that, you just don't have the time. Results, positive. The cockpit is a pilot's office. Management of that office must be as precise and efficient as the complex instruments with which it is equipped. One flight of many flights. And there isn't a combat pilot who doesn't know it. Every bullet, every gallon of oil, every mortar stopped north of that 17th parallel can mean the life of one man, 10 men, 100 men, south of that peril. Rescue Control has picked up a radio call for help from a pilot whose aircraft was hit and who had to eject. He has contacted the Jolly Greens and given them a fix on the down pilot's approximate position. I didn't realize my plane had been hit until the cockpit started filling up with smoke. I punched out. When that parachute blossomed, I took a long, deep breath. Then I landed in the trees, and I don't really remember how I managed to climb down to the ground. I let out a shout for help on my radio, then scrambled up the hill to get as close to the top as I could. I shot off some pen flares when I saw the A1Es and the Jolly Green. It's hard to put into words exactly how I felt when I knew that Jolly Green was going to get me out. Let's just say I prayed a little, on my own account, and for those guys of search and air rescue. 100 missions to be flown. It's good to know you're not alone. If a shrapnel stuff means I have to jump, then the jolly green will pick me up clean. Till a hundred missions I myself have flown. One flight's mission has been completed, but the long day's work is far from over. First, will come the detailed intelligence debriefing at Tactical Operations Center. After the official debriefing, flight leaders hold a session for critiquing their flight's performance as a unit and as individuals. Was there a delay in acquiring the target? Did one of the men press too low? Did they regroup promptly after hitting the target? Was element integrity maintained? You can never stop learning. 
you might get away with an error in judgment one day. Tomorrow, you may not be as lucky. One flight of many flights. But operations continue around the clock. For the ground crews, it's 12 hours or more a day. Six days or more a week. It could be drudgery if every man on the ground didn't know and understand that they are the ones who make it possible for those who fly to complete their missions. It's about 13.30 hours now, half past one in the afternoon of a day like every other day. Another flight takes off on another mission. Now, those who went out earlier have a couple of hours off duty. 100 missions to be flown. A hundred bridges to be blown On my left and right The rest of my flight Help keep me alive in my 105 Till a hundred missions I myself have flown No matter what they do or how relaxed they seem Pilots always wonder what tomorrow's target will be, a milk run or a tough one. The answer comes at about 1,800 hours, when flight planning for the next morning strike starts. Usually, flight planning takes two or three hours. On a new tough target, that time can easily be doubled. A fragmentary order, FRAG for short, comes to the Wing Tactical Operations Center and is the small part of the overall order that relates to the fighter wings. The orders come down from DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Then at wing level, they are broken down and missions assigned to the squadrons. There are many frags that make up a day's total coordinated effort. We believe this essential to help safeguard the freedom of South Vietnam and to save the lives of those South Vietnamese, Americans, Australians, and Zealanders and Koreans who are fighting to ensure that freedom. The aircraft our pilots fly are compact, highly maneuverable machines. They have the inherent speed and versatility to be effective in air-to-air -air or air-to-ground combat. But they are only machines. They must be maintained. The record of keeping flying hours at a rate three times normal use speaks loudly and clearly for the kind of men who work with their hearts as well as with their minds and hands. Men are brave in many ways, and there are many ways in which a man can show his courage. Courage can't be judged by a casual glance or the sound of a voice. Any fighting man will tell you, you must know fear in order to find your true strength. Want a portrait of a hero? Take a snapshot of a pilot. Or another. Or another. Move your camera out to the line for long shots. Or for close-ups. Carry it inside aircraft vehicle control to watch the men who often don't even see the planes. They help keep flying. Let your camera travel into the air to fly with the men of the Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Service. You'll never find a man who thinks himself a hero or even considers himself as particularly brave. But they all share a common bond and a common pride. They are all working members of the same fighting team, fighting each in his own way to try to slow down and, if possible, to break down the flow of supplies to the south and to adversely affect the will of North Vietnam toward carrying on their aggressive operations. The total task is large, and yet, as it always is, each small fragment of that total is very personal. Men may live 3,000 miles or more apart back home in the States, but here there are no state lines, no county lines, no country boys or city boys. 
No one asks their social position or who their ancestors might or might not have been. Nor do we as a nation know what we as a nation have done to have deserved men such as these. Perhaps they reflect the courage and the strength instilled in them by their mothers and their fathers. Perhaps it is the heritage of men who came before, men who stood at Concord Bridge, men who walked through Chateau Thierry, through the Ardennes Forest, and the undergrowth of Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. Men who ranged the skies over Pacific atolls and over Africa and Europe half a world away. We do not know what we have done to produce men such as these. But we do know these are our men, our fathers, our sons, our brothers. It is only right that not only should we be proud of them, we can be proud of them.